Hello and welcome to the Northern Myths Podcast, where we explore the myths and legends of Northern Europe from an archetypal perspective. I'm Luke DeWolf. And I'm Dan Larrabee. Today, we're returning to our series on the Kalevala with Kalevala Runo 8, Väinämöinen's Wound. This is going to be an exciting episode about Väinämöinen's journey through the land of Pohjola back home to Kalevala but he's going to get distracted on the way and meet with a lovely maiden of Pohyla. And we're going to see all that happens there. And it's going to be, it's actually got some great discussion points in it. So I'm, I'm fairly excited about this one. Me too. It's, it's a, another one of the a shorter poem, but there's a lot of good stuff in it. So I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to get into it and see what uh, happens with the Vinamoyan. Definitely. And just to recap where we were last time, the last episode, the last Call of All episode was all about how Vainamunen was recovering from getting shot into the sea by Jokahainen. And that was two poems ago, if you recall. And he met with Lohi, the mistress of Pohila, the ruler of the unknown. And she set him on a task to bring back the magical Sampo. Something that Vainamunen can't do himself, but he he knows who can, so that's pretty good. Hopefully he gets something like a finder's fee for that. But the thing she told him right at the end was that he needed to keep his head down on his journey back home. And we we had a couple of ideas about what that might mean and related that to a few stories where, say, the hero has to do something, but only if he doesn't look back. And if he looks back, he, he loses what he was, was after, or he even gets destroyed or something like that. And, well, we're going to see here what exactly might happen if Vainamuna doesn't keep his head down on his journey. Yes, that's right. The, the options that we sort of saw were, were either Vainamuna, he is able to lift his head and everything is good, and he has sort of a, almost like a godlike position in the universe or he looks something bad happens and it shows the sort of the human frailty that we all have so i guess we'll see uh what type of person vitamin winner is exactly so before we dive into this we just have our usual housekeeping a few things to mention and the biggest thing now is that if you would like to support the show, you can now do so via Patreon. That's definitely the best way you can support the show if you would like. We're at patreon.com slash northern myths, and we're doing a lot of behind the scenes content and just extra stuff for Patreon supporters as well. If you like, you can sign up to get episodes early, basically as soon as they're edited and they're ready, we can release them early to subscribers. And it it's by far the best way you can support the show if you would like. So if you want to head over there and, and take a look, we'd certainly appreciate it if you'd like to support the show. And of course, we also always appreciate reviews on iTunes or wherever else you might be listening to this podcast. It's always a big help, gets us in front of more ears, more eyes if you're on YouTube. And speaking of YouTube as well, we always appreciate a subscribe. If you haven't visited our YouTube channel, uh, a subscribe, a visit and a subscribe on there is always appreciated as well. And it's, again, just things like that help us to reach a larger audience and hopefully grow and get b bigger and better as we go. So, and of course, you can get in touch with us on social media if you like. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Northern Myths or Northern Myths Podcast on all platforms. We're also personally on Twitter, North Myth Luke and North Myth Dan. So feel free to get in touch with us if you like. Okay, I think with that, let's dive in. Let's dive back into the land of heroes. Let's do it. Okay, Runo 8, Vainamoinen's Wound. Oh, man. Already, already making uh, slips of the tongue. Vainamunin's Wound. Back to the poem. Lines 1 to 16. Lovely was the maid of Pohya, famed on land, on water peerless, on the arch of air high seated, brightly shining on the rainbow, clad in robes of dazzling luster, clad in raiment white and shining, 
There she wove a golden fabric, interwoven all with silver, and her shuttle was all golden, and her comb was all of silver. From her hand flew swift the shuttle. In her hands the reel was turning, and the copper shafts they clattered, and the silver comb resounded as the maiden wove the fabric and with silver interwove it. What do you think of that, Dan? Well, I think that we have just a great example of the the goal, the maiden that Vinamoinen is trying to find and woo. The this is the the princess in, in the castle that that Vinamoinen is trying to rescue, or you know that we go a little more modern, but still retro. Is like this would be the the princess that you go through all the castles. And then finally you get to the right castle and it's not that, oh, your princess is another castle. No, this is the princess. And archetypally, it's very important for Vinamoinen, who we've kind of established through these uh, poems that he is a, he's a stand-in for civilization and, you know, the old father, right? And this is a great opportunity for him to find well find a mate find that that spark that will provide sort of the divine child the the, the, usually a son that will sort of carry on right and this is this is why he went into poya in the beginning was to find find a maiden to make his wife and to you know continue on with you know i guess the vine and name sort of putting it uh not like putting it sort of crassly it's just you know but it's the he's looking to to have that that beautiful connection between order and chaos that can you know that can straddle the line it's you know the, he he wants to give birth to the hero and he thinks he's found um a possible mate and it, it's i love the description of of her because like clearly just beautiful radiant uh dazzling everything you'd want in you know in a mate and i I think it really shows the you know that feeling when you when you have like potential opportunity that's gonna that could go really well and you you're filled with that energy and life when i was reading that i was like that this is this is what they're talking about you know that's the when you see her you're just like yeah you know what there's something here that it could go really well. Uh, and then in addition to this, and man, like I, I'm so impressed by, by this, the symbolism here. Uh, when they talk about her working with a shuttle, that's a part of a weaving. I, I didn't know about this. I had to look it up, but it's, uh, it's connected with the bobbin and all that kind of stuff. And weaving is a huge, like hugely symbolic one for uh, just for the feminine, but also uh, like in uh, when you're looking at possibilities in the future, because it, it's it's combining like materials that were separate to make something brand new, and it's just like it, it's such a perfect symbol for what Vinam Wynn wants to combine hit like himself with her and make something completely brand new. So I, I just love that they have that, that detail there. It's it's also, um, a sign of opening and closing of, uh, cycles. So, uh, stories or ages. So it, it, there's a, a real sense that this could be the, the end that, that creates the new beginning, you know, like, Vinamoinen's story wouldn't necessarily be over, but it, you know, his search for a wife that would come, that would be done, and then I'm assuming they would have children, and that's like that's the new beginning, and a new cycle would begin. So it, like, all of this in just 16 lines, like this is what what we have here. So it it sets up this 
this poem beautifully and it kind of sums up what Vinamoinen is doing up until now. Like I just I just love this first part. Yeah, exactly. I I completely agree. She's the maiden of Pohya. We've we've seen her before interspersed with within different poems and stories and and so she's always been there but now here she is we haven't ever had quite the description of her she's not necessarily the only maiden of pohyla but she is the one we have in front of us and that's definitely a good goal for vainamunin and i like that you mentioned of course that we talked about how vainamunin is a stand in for culture or social order things like that the paradox with Vainamoinen is that he also is attempting to fill the role of the hero himself. And that could be where he's having a little bit of trouble because he's trying to be the hero while at the same time be the patriarchal father. And maybe that, well, maybe that'll come into play a little bit later here as far as what he's actually doing. But he wants to win the maiden, win the favor of the maiden for sure. And if this is what is by the the road for Vainamoinen. I mean, I don't know how he's going to keep his head down and ignore that. So, oh, absolutely. First of all, he's he's obviously looked, and and why wouldn't you? I mean, there's no. He's obviously we're, we're obviously going to see the the human frailty. You know the the, uh, the the I guess the sad stuff that we all have to deal with being human, and I mean. Vinamoiner is not the only person to get in trouble for looking at a beautiful woman, right? So it's a very it's a very real and natural I almost want to say temptation or like failing. This isn't this isn't something that's just out there and mythical. It's like no, this is real stuff that we see every day. We know people that have fallen into a trap like this. It's not it's not weird. It's very common, very normal. And uh, so I guess Vinamoinen isn't quite the the deity that he could... Well, I mean, he's he's got magical powers, but, you know, he, he's definitely still... He still has that, that taint of humanness. For sure. He's actually, to me, he's got more in common with a saga type hero than he does with an actual god, which is, which is interesting. And we've been having some discussions... Uh, online a little bit with our listeners or viewers this was actually on youtube about how how gods were a little bit de-emphasized early on in original practice and things like that and so and so having a hero also makes sense on a lot of levels and it fits in with the epic poem type idea and so vainamoinen certainly isn't this omnipotent deity who can get whatever he wants he's he's definitely an example on a lot of levels, both of what to do and what not to do. He he has been in the past of, of both a little bit, especially his handling of the whole Yoka Hine and Aino situation. And he might be an example of both of those qualities later in this poem. I, I do also just want to say, though, that with the the weaving as well, I think what this shows is that this maiden of Pohya is not only beautiful, but competent. She's doing one of those things, the highest thing really symbolically that it's associated almost university with, universally with the feminine. Although we have touched on how weaving in some cultures is exclusively in the realm of men. It, it appears to be something that is done by either men or women in a culture and usually by women in a culture. But in this case, it's that she she is able to beautifully weave all this fabric and everything like that which which is essentially a symbolic stand-in for being able to weave fate as well like we've mentioned before and her being competent in that means she's not only just this beautiful figure who on surface level beauty really just is an indication of fertility essentially both in men and women but competency that's something else and so this Maiden of Pohyla is even more desirable because she's able to do the things that are associated with the highest aspects of femininity on a symbolic level, like the potential to create something new. So across the board, this is definitely a, a desirable person for, for Vainamoinen or for anyone really. 
And shall we see what Vainamarinen is going to do when he sees her? Let's do it. Okay. Lines 17 to 50. Back to the poem. Vainamarinen, old and steadfast, thundered on upon his journey. From the gloomy land of Pohya, Sariola forever misty. Short the distance he had traveled, short the way that he had journeyed. When he heard the shuttle whizzing high above his head, he heard it. Thereupon his head he lifted, and he gazed aloft to heaven, and beheld a glorious rainbow. On the arch the maiden seated, as she wove a golden fabric. As the silver comb resounded, Bainamunin, old and steadfast, stayed his horse upon the instant, and he raised his voice and speaking in such words as these addressed her. Come into my sledge, O maiden, in the sledge beside me seat thee. Then the maiden made him answer, and in words like these responded. Wherefore should the maiden join you in the sledge beside you seated? Vainamoinen, old and steadfast, heard her words and then responded. Therefore should the maiden join me in the sledge beside me seat her. Bread of honey to prepare me, and the best of beer to brew me. Singing blithely on the benches, gaily talking at the window. When in Bainala. I sojourn at my home in Kalevala. So Vainamoinen looked. We knew that was coming, but it's still... I like that they make a, a point of it, you know, thereupon his head he lifted and gazed aloft to heaven. Like, they're really, like, pointing it out that, yes, he, he looked. And then sees the beautiful maiden and invites her into the sledge. I have to admit, um, his tactics could use a little work, I think, because it's like, hey, it's going to be so great. You're going to make food for me and beer and you're going to talk to me. It's going to be great. And that's not, you would think he might go in the other direction, you know, to to show his worth to her. Because as we know, uh, it's usually uh, the female that selects mates, at least in humans. And yeah, so he's... He's not really showing his worth. He's <laughs> he's talking about all the worth that she would provide him. So I thought that was kind of a, a let's say a bold move on his part. But it, it, it's obviously or obvious that this is exactly what Vinamoinen is looking for. This this beautiful woman to become his wife and to bear children for him and, and create a home for him. This is the the connection that he's looking for, the that spark of chaos to his order that will that will allow him to survive and continue on and all that kind of stuff. So it's uh it's sort of the that flashpoint where like he's going he's going after he sees what he wants, you know he saw it with Aino as well, and now he's he's going after because I th- w- he knows, and we all know that he needs that he needs that interaction with chaos and the feminine to uh, be able to survive and not just decay into nothing. Exactly, and I agree with you that his tact could use some work because, especially from a modern point of view, the things he's telling her it, it really seems. Pretty sexist, to be honest, as far as we would be concerned these days. Like, basically, come into my kitchen and make stuff for me, right? But I think what it is actually saying, though, is more on a symbolic level, this is the role that you would fit into. And it doesn't really do a good job of, like you said, showing her the benefits to her what society can provide. And maybe on some level that says that society doesn't do a great job of actually 
saying why it's useful and why it's important. We certainly see that today with essentially the the whole anti-patriarchy movement. On a lower level, that really is a movement against all of the social order that has built up over millennia, generations. And the thing about it is that social order can become tyrannical. And certainly there are elements of that at play today, for sure. But throwing out the entire system is not the greatest idea because that throws you into complete chaos. There's societies in the world that have thrown out their social order completely and they're not doing so great. So the the thing about it is I think society and social order in this case being embodied by Van der Moenen is not doing a great job of telling its women what they can get out of the mutually beneficial arrangement that is the construct of essentially marriage is what this is. And not only can marriage provide for that spark of chaos, that potential to create the next generation, the hero, hopefully, the potential of the hero. I mean, that's why we love babies just kind of in general, because you know, you, you can see just about anyone how they'll react to like a baby on the on the street sort of thing, just seeing them, you know, usually people smile, right? And I think there's a a big reason for that is just because that baby could turn into the hope for the next generation. They can turn into the hero that does everything. I think that's every parent's hope for their child and society in general's hope for every child. And so that potential is certainly there from marriage, but it's also mutually beneficial in the ways of of how they can provide social protection for one another, the the man and the woman who become married, and the they can complement each other's skills. It's just so much easier to, if you have two people than one, to get ahead in the world. Like, I mean, if if a couple waits until being married to have children and builds careers and things like that together and gets their feet under them, they're going to have a much greater chance of success than if, you know, there's, there's kids out of wedlock sort of thing. And both people still trying to keep a roof over their heads, two separate locations, things like that. It gets a lot harder. And, and so there are benefits. There are a lot of benefits to the social order, but in this case, and I think maybe kind of in general, Society doesn't do the greatest job of explaining that. And so Vanyamunin has has looked and made an offer, but doesn't seem like the maiden is all that enthusiastic to accept. No. And why would she? I mean, the offer wasn't wasn't a great offer. He I'm I think we know he's definitely got things to offer her that would you know, that would make him a, a valuable husband, but he doesn't go into any of that. It's, oh, you're going to make me, or you're, you're going to be such a valuable wife. Like, so it's kind of funny and, and we will see sort of how that plays out a bit, but it, it's been interesting. Um, we've been hearing throughout the Kalevala, Vina Moynan, old and steadfast. So it's, it tells us really that he, like he's steady and set in his ways and in some ways that's great like it's secure stable all good things but I, I think we're starting to see the the tragedy of it in that he's having a he is old and he's he hasn't been able to find he, he hasn't been able to rejuvenate himself he hasn't found that well in this case a wife that will allow his allow for the continuation of society and everything. So I'm actually, I'm starting to get the feeling like this is going to turn into uh, more of a tragedy than a, than like a triumphant story for Vinam women. But I don't know. I'm just, I, or at least the tension for me is there where it's like, Oh, this could, this could actually go badly for Vinam women. And, and it's one of those tragedies. I think they're usually called like Greek tragedies where it's the fatal, like the fatal flaw in the hero and the hero can't do anything about it. And it's just like, you, and you just have to watch it unfold and it's painful and cringy. And you're like, no, like just do it. But he, they can't So yeah, I'm, I'm starting to get a little apprehensive for Vina morning. Cause I, I tend to, I 
generally like him, but it's just like, oh man, this this could be going badly for you. You are going to love the ending, and please, please, please don't read the the last Runo fifty. Don't don't read it till we're there. Don't read it till we're there because oh, you're gonna love it. Okay, I I won't uh, I won't read it till we're there. And uh, if if you're listening and and you haven't read all the way to the end and you're just following along with us, I highly recommend, highly recommend, leave Runo fifty. Leave Runo fifty. It's it's uh, listen along with us when we get there. It's quite something. Just talking about the way things are going to go. No spoilers, though. No spoilers. Shall we move on? Yes. Okay. This is going to be lines 51 to 90. Back to the poem. Then the maiden gave him answer, and in words like these addressed him. As I wandered through the bed straw, tripping o'er the yellow meadows. Yesterday, in time of evening, as the sun was slowly sinking, in the bush a bird was singing, and I heard the field fair trilling, singing of the whims of maidens and the whims of new-wed damsels. Thus the bird was speaking to me, and I questioned it in this wise. Tell me, O thou little field fair, sing thou that my ears may hear it, whether it indeed is better, whether thou hast heard tis better, for a girl in father's dwelling, or in household of a husband. Thereupon the bird made answer, and the field fair answered chirping. Brilliant is the day, in summer, but a maiden's lot is brighter, and the frost makes cold the iron, yet the new bride's lot is colder. In her father's house a maiden lives like strawberry in the garden, but a bride in house of husband lives like house dog tightly fettered. To a slave comes rarely pleasure. To a wedded damsel, never. Vainamun and Old and Steadfast answered in the words which follow. Song of birds is idle chatter, and the throstles merely chirping, as a child a daughter's treated, but a maid must needs be married. Come into my sledge, O maiden, in the sledge beside me seat thee. I am not a man unworthy. Lazier not than other heroes. Well, that bird is certainly not helping out Vinamoinen at all. That is, uh, that's a hard one to uh, get around. And it's interesting because, you know, the bird says, you know, the, the maiden is treated as a strawberry in the garden and, you know, the wife is a slave or even worse off than a slave. Like it, just never, never has any fun, never, no pleasure whatsoever. And it's the, the image of the strawberry, I mean, strawberries in general considered like beautiful fruit. They're red, they're attractive. You want to eat them. They taste good. But what, and actually before I go to the, butt, and, and their seeds, things grow from them. Right. And, and the, the reason why they're so delicious and appealing is that they want to be eaten and then, you know, go through the digestive tract of an animal. And then it's, you know, planted, let's say with its own fertilizer, like it, it's a, a pretty good delivery system for the seed to, you know, spread more strawberries throughout the land. But the strawberry doesn't have any consciousness it doesn't like decide to get eaten it doesn't do anything it's just there in a garden it's tended to and it, people look at it and say oh that's what a beautiful strawberry and the they acknowledge the potential of it you know how good it's going to taste and all the things they can do with it they can make pie or cobbler or you know god uh, get some milk from the cow and make cream that kind of thing like it's there's all this potential with it but un it's still just a strawberry there's no there's no consciousness there. There's no 
it's not awake. It's just a thing that can be used. And with, with a beauty of its own, but still it's, there's nothing there. And then the other option being the slaves that you wake up to the reality of life and that in some ways we're all, we're all slaves to the human condition. You know, we are all going to get sick. We all get hungry. We all bad things happen. All of us. It's, it's a, you know, it's a hard life. And see the choice here, the, what the bird is saying is that, you know, in this one state you're, you can be, well, we even have, we even have a word for it. Like you can be in a vegetative state. I mean, it's a fruit technically, but it's st- very similar. It's, you know, in a vegetative state or, or you can wake up to the harsh reality of life and, and deal with it there. And that, like, it, I don't know if you were given the choice, would you, would you stay asleep or would you decide to wake up into, into life and, and the consciousness? I don't know. I mean, we don't, in some ways we don't get a choice. A lot of times we're forced to wake up. And then there's also a lot of uh, ways in which we like purposefully stay unconscious and then, you know, things will happen to us and we're like, how did that happen? And it's because we're unconscious about what we're doing to bring that about in our life. So, well, that was the the choice that Adam and Eve faced in the Bible right at the very beginning. And it's funny that the the fruit metaphor is is roughly the same. the The thing about what the the choice this maiden has to go through is it's interesting. the The bird to me and the perspective of the bird. We've seen birds a couple of other times more than than actually I realized because I didn't know that a titmouse was a bird and we saw a titmouse in a in a previous episode and I didn't know that was a bird we still had a relatively valid interpretation of what the titmouse was was doing it's kind of a, a lowly creature by hierarchy's standards but it it's a bird so thanks to my friend Kyle for pointing that out but <laughs> but the the concept of the bird here in this case to me, it seems like some kind of natural wisdom or common sense that would be appealing on the face of it, sort of, it would be intuitively appealing to someone in the maiden's situation. That's the best I can do as far as having the perspective of what the bird is saying. Like everything around her seems to be telling her that she's good where she is because it's pretty good. It's pretty good by all things considered like life wasn't necessarily easy back in the day but if she's in the house of her father and it's in relatively good order sort of thing well maybe things aren't so bad maybe she has chores to do things to do which we actually saw previously in in previous poems was that the maiden of Pohila was quite industrious and in doing things before everyone woke up she went and collected logs of driftwood from the the tree of wisdom back way back in Runo 2. It's always only a maiden of Pohila or the maiden of Pohila. We don't know if it's the same one necessarily, but it just shows that her and her sisters, they're all implied to be sisters and daughters of Lohi. They're all implied to be that. They're industrious and and all that, but they they still have a life as a, a maiden. And what Vaina Moon is certainly telling her is that, yeah, that's that's not the way the world is. He's still not making a great pitch. He's still not saying why you have to do this in order to really achieve anything, essentially. But if the Maiden of Pohila were to accept Vayanamunin's proposition and wake up and take on the responsibility, which to her, and of course across much of history has been the case, the responsibility for the woman is to is to take care of any children that may result from the marriage. And and that may seem unequal to us these days in terms of we don't have any restrictions on who can go get a job or anything like that, especially between men and women or anything. And lots of women have great careers and all that. But there really is some deep down biological and psychological things that mean that women are much better at caring for children and they they bond with their children in a way that fathers just essentially don't and there's some great fathers out there who 
do a lot of this this job on their own single fathers things like that but it's it's rare and the mother is broadly her responsibility is to take care of the children and get them ready for the world sort of thing and that's the responsibility that she would be looking forward to the maiden of Polhila. and that's a tough responsibility man like that's not easy i definitely don't think that looking that childbirth and and raising kids is necessarily something that's looked forward to especially nowadays where maybe it's a little de-emphasized from having kids but then eventually you know a lot of women start getting to a certain point where it's like they start really wanting to have kids and i think on some level they know it's going to be hard and and tough but a lot of times it's described as the most fulfilling thing Diana Moon is not communicating any of that here. No, he isn't. It's not even till the end where he's like, you know, I'm not a man unworthy, lazier not than other heroes. And it's like, well, that's good. Like, you don't want to be lazy, but you could have even like sold it a little bit better. Like I'm a hard worker, you know, not just I'm not lazy. No, it's. Uh, yeah, it's funny. And, and just. What would the kids say? He's got no game. Yeah. And and just to to build a little bit on what you're saying with uh with like childbearing and accepting that responsibility. Um I mean there's what do you see in media like the, the jokes about like the biological clock ticking and and I think I think it's de-emphasized, but I also think men have a an innate sense of this is how this is at least one way where I will pa- how I'll pass on my legacy, right? Like there's there's kind of an immortality in there for them. And it's um, like, it, it's crazy to think about just think about like your ancestors, like how long have humans been around for? And I, I think it's about like 150,000 years. I think it's something like that. Feel free to correct me though. Um, it hasn't been, I don't think it's been shorter than that. So it's, and like we're here now. So all of our ancestors have been able to procreate up till now, which Every time you think about it, it doesn't get old. It's just like, that is crazy. Think of all the ways people die and they were able to procreate before they die. That's, that's nuts. And I, I think we all have that innate drive that like, okay, at a certain point, it's like, man, it's, it's getting on, like death is becoming more likely. We need to, <laughs> we need to make sure our genes uh, go on. And then you're talking about the, uh, the bond between a mother and her child. And I mean, there is a, I'm not, I'm not going to disparage the bond between a father and child at all, but the father doesn't carry the, the baby to term and, you know, inside of him for, you know, 10 months. And I know they say it's nine months, but really it's 10. And, and, um, when the baby is born, there's a rush of serotonin and that, that's like the the chemical inside you that gives you um, sort of that lovey-dovey warm feeling. And women get a huge rush of that when they, uh, when they give birth to the point where it kind of uh, makes them forget about the pain so that they would be willing to do it again. Like it, it's crazy. Like that there's a, there's a hormone in the, in a, in, well, men have it as well, but to a much lesser degree and, we generally uh, only get that rush of of bonding, um, you know. After let's say uh, after being with our partner in a physical way, and so I, and actually, like if you want, you can use that to you know, I'm not saying how to manipulate your your man or whatever, but it is a way if you want him to feel all warm and fuzzy towards you. This is like a chemical way to do it, a hormonal way to do it, but. It's not, and it's not nearly as, as powerful as obviously giving birth, but, um, yeah. So this hormone lets women kind of forget the bad stuff about it and just feel this intense attachment to this baby, which is great because I mean, the baby is completely dependent on the mother for quite a long time. Like, yeah. So it's all to say it is a it's a whole thing. Like this is a big deal. This isn't, Oh, get married. And it's like, no, this is life stuff that will 
it changes everything and it's hard work. Definitely. And the only other thing I'll say about this poem and the social context around this is that there was no birth control. There wasn't the pill, anything like that. So there wasn't the mechanisms of for women to not essentially have this as their responsibility or even I'll say primary responsibility because essentially that would have been the case. You would have gotten married and kids would have came from that relatively quickly uncontrolled. So that really would have been what this would have meant is that if she becomes mar- married to Vina Moon and like pretty darn quick, she's going to have kids. So just for some social context on that, this is the order of the world when this was being written down. Something that we haven't actually touched upon, but it's probably pretty important in this regard, just, you know, because the, uh, the plight of women isn't hard enough already, but also childbirth itself was deadly. Like it was, maybe it wasn't 50, 50, but it wasn't much better than that. that You might die during childbirth. Like it, (laughs) it was a dangerous, uh, a dangerous proposition. And and so then you think about women who had many children. It's like, that's impressive that you rolled the dice that many times and, and we're okay. And I mean, still today, even with all of our modern medicine, childbirth is still dangerous. It is super dangerous. So not to discourage anyone, but it, it is, you know, you do roll the dice. Yeah. Even in fully developed countries with modern medicine and everything, it, it can be quite, quite the process. And there are certainly risks to it. And in countries that don't have this level of, of medicine that we have in the Western world, it's it's pretty much it starts to get towards that flip of the coin sort of thing. And you know, the the numbers that I like to to throw out as far as explaining some of the processes of how evolution is controlled by women and by the feminine, the the number of children that the average woman has had throughout time is one. And the average number of children that the average man has had throughout time is one, but it's much more close to most women have one child and men either have two or zero, right? Which is, is to say that only the, the most, the most competent and valuable men get to reproduce, but most women get to reproduce. And one of the ways that I think numbers kind of get explained that way is a lot of women might have their one kid and then not have any more because they might die in childbirth, that sort of thing. And of course, a lot of women would have zero kids because of maybe them and their child dies in in childbirth the first time sort of thing. But then that nice, valuable man would take another wife and try again, keep trying again, basically until he dies. So that can explain in one way some of the discrepancy as far as men who get to reproduce and the number of children they have and women getting to reproduce and it's it's harsh reality and this is this is what Vainamunin is is talking about not again not well and what the bird is sort of saying in a in a very romantic sort of way like hey you don't need to do that this turned into a downer pretty quick (laughs) yeah it did it might get better should we should we see where this goes yeah let's see where it goes This will be lines 91 to 106. Back to the poem. But the maid gave crafty answer, and in words like these responded, As a man, I will esteem you, and as hero will regard you. If you can split up a horsehair with a blunt and pointless knife blade, and an egg in knots you tie me, yet no knot is seen upon it. Dynamonin, old and steadfast, then the hair in twain divided, with a blunt and pointless knife blade, with a knife completely pointless, and an egg in knots he twisted, yet no knot was seen upon it. Then again he asked the maiden, in the sledge to sit beside him. This is interesting because it's a very common theme in sort of mythological romances where the the man is given impossible tasks to 
to accomplish in order to win the maiden's hand. Uh, we, and we still see it today. Like uh, there's a song Scarborough Scarborough Fair, uh, where you know they're talking. Uh, the uh, this young lad is trying to woo a woman, and she says, "Well, if you do this and this and this, um, you know, you can have my hand in marriage." And they're impossible tasks. We see it uh, in the story of uh, Ragnar Lothbrok, where uh, he summons uh, Aslog and he says like come neither dressed nor undressed hungry nor full and all these all these things that are kind of impossible to do because there's no, there's not a lot of room between them uh and then we see it we see a certain type of it as well and we talked about this in the last Calavella episode but doing impossible things like uh Orpheus saving Eurydice from from Hades and not being able to bring her out without looking behind and make sure she's there or um, Gilgamesh saving his friend and Kiddu from, from death by staying up for seven days and seven nights. Like it's this idea of a, uh, impossible task is a, a well-known, I guess you'd call it trope throughout, throughout the world and how you can I guess it, one, it shows human failing and that humans aren't these omnipotent creatures and there are things that can't be done, but also um, kind of a, a fun way to, that there, there is, at least in uh, the romantic, the more romantic ones like, like this, there is kind of a game that gets played between men and women where men have to show their worth. And it's like, I am this valuable that you have to do this impossible thing. And then the man goes out and tries to do it and yeah sometimes he succeeds sometimes he doesn't and in this case Vanyan Amirian has no trouble it doesn't even really say he, he has any struggle with it he just does it these are literally impossible tasks like they they do not seem possible maybe he's got some magic going on there who knows but he gets it done he's competent he is the top of the dominance hierarchy like he has got this he is worthy of this maiden in Apohila. So he's proving his worth in a way that he, he certainly wasn't able to before. Now the question is, is this, is this maiden setting him this task because she wants to make sure he's worthy? Or is she setting him this task because she doesn't want him to be able to complete it? And so... There's a, there's definitely something that we can look into as far as that goes. But first off here, Vainamirinen has done the job right off the bat here, splitting the hair of a horse with a blunt knife and tying an egg in knots. Those do not seem to be possible things at all, but no trouble with them, apparently. Yeah, the egg and the knot won it. Or like the, that one just blows my mind. I don't even, I don't even know how you'd craftily get around that. Like with, with Auslog when Ragnar calls for her and it's like, be hungry nor full. She comes eating, which is sort of the, the midpoint between the two. It's like, oh, clever, you know, and neither dressed nor undressing while she comes like dressing herself in the process. So it's like, okay, this is, you know, you're clever. This is good. That one, I'm just like, I have no idea how you would do like even in a sort of riddly way, get around that. So, yeah. He's certainly got some competency for sure. Now, do we want to take a look and see what comes after that? I think so. Okay. This is going to be lines 107 to 144. Back to the poem. But the maid gave crafty answer. I, perchance, at length may join you, if you'll peel the stone I give you, and a pile of ice will hew me, but no splinter scatter from it, nor the smallest fragment loosen. Vainamoinen, old and steadfast, did not find the task a hard one. From the stone the rind he severed, and a pile of ice he hewed her, but no splinters scattered from it, nor the smallest fragment loosened. 
Then again, he asked the maiden in the sledge to sit beside him. But the maid gave crafty answer, and she spoke the words which follow. No, I will not yet go with you. If a boat, you cannot carve me. From the splinters of my spindle, from the fragments of my shuttle, and shall launch the boat in water, push it out upon the billows. But no knee shall press against it, and no hand must even touch it, and no arm shall urge it onward, neither shall a shoulder guide it. Vainamainen, old and steadfast, answered in the words which follow, None in any land or country under all the vault of heaven like myself can build a vessel, or so deftly can construct it. Then he took the spindle splinters, of the reel he took the fragments, and began the boat to fashion, fixed a hundred planks together, on a mount of steel he built it, built it on the rocks of iron. So the tasks are getting harder, which if you thought that was possible, I mean, he's now he's got to smash some ice without it shattering, which that's nuts. Um, peel a stone and then build this boat. Like this is has some hardcore stuff for him to do. And Vinam is just, just doing it. He's not even breaking a sweat. He's like, Oh, okay. Like what else do you want me to do? This, this isn't challenging. Uh, and again, we're seeing Vinam win at the, at the top of the dominance hierarchy. And it, I'm, I'm actually kind of glad, at least from story perspective that they did this because he's had a bit of uh, bad luck lately and it would be easy to think, Oh, Vinamwin's kind of, I don't know, kind of a putz. Like he's not that great. He's weak. He's he's a kind of a, I don't know, a little bit of a buffoon maybe. But here we have like he's doing these impossible tasks, and and we're seeing sort of the old Vinamwin and like when he's uh, fighting with Yokohain and like he he's a master at this. There's, there's no there's no doubt about it. And then like even with the boat, I. I I love that, you know, carve me a boat with these things. First of all, the, the items themselves are quite small. And, uh, you know, push, push it upon the, the billows, but no knee shall press against it. No hand must even touch it all. Like, you would have to be, you'd have to be a magician to be able to do this. And it just so happens Vitamoinen is, and the best magician around. So he's able to, uh, He's quite sure he'll be able to do this without any problem at all. Exactly. He's up to these challenges and he's fulfilling them, right? And again, the it comes to mind that these tasks are getting harder and harder. He already fulfilled one set, then he fulfilled a second set. Now we're on to our third. I'm getting more and more of the feeling that the, the maiden doesn't really want to even entertain the idea of marrying Vainamoinen and maybe it goes back to the whole the whole bird thing right where maybe the little bird in her ear is getting to her as far as she doesn't even want to leave being a maiden and maybe that's its own social issue that we might have to wrangle with but right now we're dealing with how she is with with Vainamoinen and again maybe if we're being charitable She's making sure he's the best, the most worthy and all that. But if she doesn't intend to marry him, you know, she's made up her mind, which is a perfectly valid position, by the way. That's that's the thing here is that it's perfectly valid for any woman, for any reason, to decide that any one man is just not going to work for her. And that's a perfectly valid position. But now she's setting him these tasks. And what happens if he fulfills all of them. What happens if he succeeds? If she doesn't want to be with him, at best, what she's done here has been to have him jump all these hoops. And if she eventually still says no at the end of the day, and I get that this is a crafty way of saying no. This is a crafty way of saying, well, if you don't do these things, you don't get me. It's it's sort of the intersection of the best possible man there is and a woman who wants 
the best possible man, but even the best possible man is not up to her her standards. It's kind of the intersection of that. And this this is played out in in movies, books, stories, I think. And the the idea here is that for the most part, she can expect for Vainamoinen or her suitor to not be up to the challenge, right? But Vainamoinen currently is darn well up to the challenge. So I wonder if she's prepared to say a straight no if that's what she wants to do. Or if Vainamoinen's going to succeed all the challenges and get the girl in the end. Maybe all she's doing is just making sure that, yeah, this guy is dedicated and he he really can do all these great things. And maybe that'll change her mind. If not for societal reasons or anything like that, maybe, maybe she she thinks he's all right, but he's got to still prove himself, which is definitely a good thing to do. It's definitely good to make sure that the the person you're intending to marry or are courting or whatever, dating, it's probably a good idea to make sure that they're worthwhile. So I definitely don't think what she's doing, what she's setting Van the Moon and up for as far as these tasks go, I'm, I don't think it's wrong. It's certainly a good thing to have standards, I think. But what if Van the Moon is up to the standard? And what if he isn't? What if he, the, the top guy, isn't up to these standards too? That's a problem as well. So we'll just have to see, I think. I think so. Let's move on. Okay. This is going to be lines 145 to 176. Back to the poem. At the boat, with zeal he labored, toiling at the work unresting, working thus one day, a second, on the third day likewise working. But the rocks his axe blade touched not, and upon the hill it rang not. But at length, Upon the third day, he, see, turned aside the axe shaft. Lempo turned the edge against him, and an evil stroke delivered. On the rocks, the axe blade glinted. On the hill, the blade rang loudly. From the rock, the axe rebounded. In the flesh, the steel was buried. In the victim's knee, it was buried. In the toes of Vainamoinen, in the flesh did Lempo drive it. To the veins did he see guide it. From the wound, the blood flowed freely, bursting forth in streaming torrents. Vainamoinen, old and steadfast, he the oldest of magicians, uttered words like those which follow and expressed himself in this wise. O thou evil axe ferocious, with thy edge of gleaming sharpness, thou hast thought to hew a tree trunk, and to strike upon a pine tree, match thyself against a fir tree, or to fall upon a birch tree. Tis my flesh that thou hast wounded, and my veins thou hast divided. Well, that's got to be painful. I, I am lucky I've never... Uh, hit myself with an axe, but I can't imagine it feels good. Um, I remember I, when I was really young, my, like my neighbor, and I, I mean like, like under five kind of thing. So I, I don't, I don't remember this, but, uh, my mom tells the story of uh, our next door neighbor almost cutting off his thumb with an axe and coming over with his hand, like wrapped in a rag and my mom having to call the ambulance and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, so like, it's a serious tool, can do a lot of damage. And Vinamoinen, the the pinnacle, the top of the dom- dominance hierarchy who can do all these things, hits himself with an axe. Like that is it's sort of unfitting for, for Vinamoinen. Like we have the very top, and this is how this is how he gets hurt and is unable to I'm assuming he's unable to complete the the tasks that are set before him so yeah and yet like for me you have to wonder how did this happen like why and for me i think it's the uh the fact that he put his head up above the sledge like this is the bad luck coming back to get him because you don't you don't get to do anything for free everything has consequences and this is 
this is it. And, you know, he probably wasn't paying as close attention as he should have because he was thinking like, oh, this is going to be so great. I'm going to build this boat. Then I'm going to get the maiden. It's going to be wonderful. And then smack, holy crap, I now have a gaping hole in my knee because of this axe. It's, uh, there's some interesting symbolism going on uh, with the, uh, the axe being made of iron. Uh, there's a lot of things about iron that are very interesting. It's uh, throughout the world, it, there's kind of a dichotomy with it. In some areas of the world, it seems this uh, amazing resource that you can that you can build out of, and you know it's just amazing. The things you build are uh, strong and valuable, and being able to work with iron is is almost akin to, to magic as well, because you have that knowledge and you're able to shape the earth itself into what you want. But there's a lot of uh, danger with it as well, because the weapons that you make with iron are far stronger than the weapons that you would have made with bronze. Like you can get, you can chop through bronze without much of an issue. And it's, it's a heavy, it's a heavy metal. I guess not in the uh, like periodic table of elements sense, but just physically it's, it's heavy. There's a lot of heft to it. If you make weapons out of it, like they're going to be serious weapons. Um, the, it's, Symbolically, it's known to be like it's harsh, it's dark, uh, polluted, and has hellish strength. And we know that, like, just any interaction you have with iron, it's super strong. You need you need to do something to be able to uh, manipulate it. And you know, you're not you can't just make something out of it with your hands, right? You need to be able to you need to use other tools, really. Um, and I, I found this. This was. Uh, well, this reminded me a little bit of um, the very beginning when the uh, the teal, the duck, lays the eggs, and there's that one iron egg. And I remember, we weren't quite sure, but uh, you had said that it's probably that idea that there's always that, that taint to the world. And uh, I think, like, one, I think it's it's been confirmed, like, yeah, that's totally what it was. And, you know, the snake in the garden, It's it's all of that. And so it, having the ax be made out of iron, it's, uh, it's just, it, it sort of, it's right. Like this, they didn't, they chose iron because of these properties uh, as well. Something I read that was quite interesting, uh, the Greek poet, uh, Hesiod in his works and days, uh, talks about the fifth race of men in the iron age. And it's an age of materialism and regression to brute force. Uh, and it, if you look at Vine and Winnen as being, uh, you know, civilization, you can you can see that this would would be harmful to it. You know, uh, a focus on materialism and regression to brute force. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that you can see those harmful effects in society today, materialism and, and brute force. And that, um, I don't want to get too doomsday scenario on it, but you know, these are things that we do see in society today. And, you know, you can decide for yourself at, you know, what level it's at in society, but you know, it, it's something that rings true today. Uh, and just some other, uh, other interesting things with, with iron. um, the, the druids uh, weren't allowed to use iron uh, because there's a belief that it needs to be kept separate from life, that it, that it was a killer. And again, we, we, see, we see that. I mean, it, the weapons that iron makes are quite good at killing people. And then, you know, his blood is spilling out. Uh, blood, of course, it, it's, a, it's not really even a symbol. It's like the vitality of of Vinamwin and it's the vitality of civilization. So this is a, a wound where civilization itself is weakened and, and it's self-inflicted, which is interesting. Um, historian Arnold Toynbee, who has uh, researched many different civilizations and their rise and their fall. Uh, he's known for saying that uh, civilizations die by suicide, never murder. And, 
you know, it's always self-inflicted. So we're seeing a self-inflicted wound here. So I'm, I'm also the whole idea that this is a tragedy is, is building and building. And I'm getting nervous because it's like, Oh crap, this is, I'm, I'm able to see all the, uh, the points where this is reflected in reality and bad things are happening. And I'm just like, Oh no, not come on. Why am winning? <laughs> That's funny. No, you make some, some great points about this. And I, I think the ones that I wanted to touch on you, you basically did this. This is definitely the, the trouble that low he foresaw, I think. And, yeah, I think he, he definitely is blinded by the potential reward of the the maiden of Apolia because, well, I think a lot of workplace accidents in general be, are the fault of the the person doing the work who gets injured, them not paying the full attention that they need to and something happens. Of course, there are freak accidents, which are definitely like they, they happen, like just some some piece of machinery fails catastrophically and and that is always not good but a lot of these accidents are yeah somebody hitting themselves with with an axe or a a tool or something like that and it can be from any number of things not being able to use the tool properly but we've pretty much heard how Vainamoinen knows how to use a lot of tools properly in this case I'm thinking carelessness is more the the fitting point of view here because he's maybe focusing on the reward not the thing that he's doing they blame it on lempo and he see who we've introduced before as essentially these evil spirits in the time of the kalavala and certainly today but they had previously been just regular natural spirits who had been demonized when christianity came through so he's they're basically blaming the devil for this for all this happening but come on dynamite is the one swinging the axe like he's the one at fault here if it if it missed or or went astray or something like that if he didn't have proper control of it whatever that's on him so and i think it's funny at the end here he's he's basically swearing at the axe basically i think it could have been much worse language and I don't know whether the translation cleaned that up or even in the original if it's poetic and clean like this. But really, I think Vainamarinen is just swearing at his axe and swearing at the situation. And he's not not happy at all. Now, the, But the other thing I wanted to touch on was that him getting injured, maybe it, it plays into the whole idea of that's the risk you take when you're doing something worthwhile. Anything worthwhile has a risk associated with it. And it's the risk of a massive reward or the risk of catastrophic failure, whether that's bodily harm or loss of livelihood or loss of even just the time put into it. That's the risk you take. And now Vayanamunin is seeing the, the negative result of the risk he has taken. And the question that I would want to ask if I were in his situation is, is this all actually worth it? And the thing about it is that if he's focusing on something unattainable, if this maiden is just been stringing him along and he's been going with it, well, then the risk was not necessarily worth it. But was it? If this maiden is the best woman he's ever going to find in the world and they're going to make a great life together if she agrees to marry him sort of thing, well, maybe this is all worth it all along. And you really can't view all this stuff as just hindsight, right? you know, something not being worth it if it doesn't work. You have to take the risk. You have to take the risk. You have to try. If something has even the chance of being worthwhile, you have to try. And that's one of those things that really separates the absolutely incredibly successful from everyday folks is that a lot of times they take the one risk that gets them all the way to enormous immense success and of course there's a lot of things that have to go right for people who have the most success possible like your bill gates is of the world or jeff bezos is or or whatnot but they also take the shot right there's the whole there's a whole thing you you miss all the shots you don't take or something like that and and this is definitely it like vanamoonen is not in a good spot here but while he took the risk and 
I think it is worth it to take the risk. You just have to know what might come from that, right? Definitely. I mean, like you said, it's it's a risk and it's definitely better to try and fail than not try at all. And and there's also because you also have to test yourself, right? You have to be you have to see if you are kind of worthy of the reward and the test is the risk and unfortunately vitamin oil has been found lacking. Well, that's it, right? And the the thing about it too is that you can always balance the potential for disaster in the case where you're taking the risk. You can always mitigate that to a point. But the thing is, some of the most worthwhile things, you just cannot mitigate every possible thing. And if you try to mitigate every possible danger or risk in the world, which is something that parents have been doing with their kids for quite a long time, and and I think socially we may even be realizing what the, the consequences of that are, if you try and mitigate every single risk possible, you're never going to achieve anything. And so sometimes you just have to, to take the risk. You can do everything right, but still not succeed. Or you can be doing everything right, but one mistake, one slip, and it's all gone. It's all gone. And so, yeah, Vitamin took that risk, made a mistake, and maybe it's all gone for him. But you know what? He still took the shot. And that's that's a good thing. He took the shot when he could get the most unattainable thing, the the highest good. He aimed for the highest good. And that's always worth doing. I guess you could say that, you know, Vinam Wynn was going to get married until he took an axe to the knee. Are you referencing are you referencing Skyrim here? Well at least uh, uh yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> I may I may play way too much uh, of that game. It's it's one of the things I do to relax. So <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, shall we move on? Yes. This will be lines one seventy seven to two eighteen. Back to the poem. Then his magic spells he uttered, and himself began to speak them. Spells of origin for healing and to close the wound completely. But he could not think of any words of origin of iron, which might serve to bind the evil and to close the gaping edges of the great wound from the iron by the blue edge deeply bitten. But the blood gushed forth in torrents, rushing like a foaming river, or the berry-bearing bushes and the heath the ground that covered. There remained no single hillock which was not completely flooded by the overflowing bloodstream which came rushing forth in torrents from the knee of one most worthy, from the toes of Vainamoinen. Vainamoinen, old and steadfast, gathered from the rocks the lichen, from the swamps the moss collected, earth he gathered from the hillocks, hoping thus to stop the outlet of the wound that bled so freely. But he could not check the bleeding, nor restrain it in the slightest. And the pain he felt oppressed him, and the greatest trouble seized him. Vainamoinen, old and steadfast, then began to weep full sorely. Thereupon his horse he harnessed. In the sledge he yoked the chestnut. On the sledge himself he mounted, and upon the seat he sat him. O'er the horse's whip he brandished, with the bead-decked whip he lashed him. And the horse sped quickly onward, rocked the sledge, the way grew shorter. And they quickly reached a village, where the path in three divided. So we're seeing the extent of... Vinamoinen's situation, he, he's not able to close the wound himself, even even with his magic, which would, that would be just demoralizing. And I, I think we, we see it how, um, you know, he, he's feeling oppressed and the greatest trouble seizes him. Like, so he, this, this person, Vinamoinen, who is able to basically do anything, is at the top, is now in a situation where he has hit himself with an axe and he himself can't close the wound. And 
I think part of that goes to the what we were talking about earlier with iron and the the special qualities it was given or attributed uh, to it. So, you know, keeping it away from anything alive and I, that. Well, actually, if we look at it from the uh, vine of civilization, like that materialism and that res- resulting to or uh, resorting to brute force, like that's a serious threat to to a civilization because you're just people are just uh, concerned with things at that point, and you don't have that. Well, what Socrates would call the noble lie, or the that story that keeps people together, you know, like. Like in America, you've got the American Constitution, and that's supposed to be the the story, the myth that they all believe in, that everyone believes in, and, and sort of basically the the rule book for how this society is going to uh, act. And if you take that away, that that would also be like that would, you'd be wounding the the uh, society. Well, I, I think we're kind of seeing that here with Vine and Wynn, that he's, there's this wound to him to, and, and civilization that he himself is not able to, to patch up. He's not able to do it. It's beyond his uh, capability, which it's sort of the idea, like this is actually like why he needed, would need a, a son, like the divine son, why he needs to marry the maiden is so that there would be someone who could rejuvenate him. You know, the, the son can rejuvenate the father and revive him so that civilization goes forth. And yeah, I think we're, we're kind of seeing that on the symbolic level that he's got this wound that just won't, uh, that won't close and the blood's getting everywhere. It, it reminds me of that, uh, that part in Nietzsche. And I'm, uh, you know, after, and I, I'm totally paraphrasing cause I just thought of it and I didn't uh, look it up, but about, you know, uh, you know, God being dead and there's not enough water in the world to wash away the blood. So. Yeah, that's a good reference there. It's uh, yeah. Nietzsche is a, is a fun guy to, to think about and to, to look into his work and, and definitely there's, he's got some insight into mythology and that's for sure. I think he's got some insight right there. The, the bit about iron that I gravitated towards here was the mention of the origin of iron. And the thing about Vainamun and looking for words of origin of iron, I believe what that implies on a symbolic level is that if you know the origin of something, that implies you have mastery over it. And Vainamun doesn't know the origin of iron. He doesn't have any words for it. And so he, therefore, is using something that he doesn't have mastery over. He's using a tool or a structure that he doesn't know how to to put together himself. And the thing is, we all do this. We absolutely all do this in the modern day, whether it's the most complex of technology, computers, phones, things like that, or even the most basic, like how many people know how to put together, say, even like a knife and fork, like some of the basic tools for for eating. Like, could you do that yourself if you had the the raw steel or something like that? Or even without the the raw materials, like can can you do that? Basic survival skills, loads of this stuff, loads of the things that we use every day. You just don't know how to to do that. And then simple stuff, that's one thing, but putting together a computer, there are very, very few people in the world who could put together a computer back to front. There's certainly some people who can repair a computer if it's broken or identify the thing at fault or something like that. And that's that's useful. But it's it's also not like you're you're not going to be making your computer processor yourself. That's that takes the resources of society like way on back. And so Vainamunin cannot say the origin of his of his tool. He doesn't have mastery over it. That's what it implies here. And the it also implies that the the wound, the the wounding is something he doesn't have mastery over. It's it's almost like he didn't take the first aid course or something like that. But but it's also like this was a risk that he was taking using this tool without knowing how to properly mitigate the risk from using it. And well, it's definitely not good. Blood going everywhere, like I mean he's a he's a 
a special guy. I don't think the average person could lose the amount of blood described here and still be living or even conscious or anything like that. But he gets himself on his way and he has to abandon his task. For sure, he has to abandon his task now. And at least he's got the wherewithal to like, okay, I got to go. I got to go find some help because I can't do this. And that also says something else, right? That he can't do this. He's the most competent guy, but He's specialized, though. He's specialized into certain things. He knows how to do certain things. He's also got gaps. Everyone's got gaps. Everyone's got skills that they don't know how to do, whether completely, like, zero knowledge whatsoever or so basic that only in the the cases where you know the very simple things that you know how to do, you could could be competent in, right? But Dandemunin certainly isn't competent here. And it also, I think, says something like he... He's taking a risk where he can't fix the consequences too. So maybe that's foolhardy in some sense, but also it just goes back to like, well, maybe he was just taking his shot, right? And he had the resources to be able to do it. And if something bad happens, well, we're going to have to deal with that when, when the time comes and the time has certainly come. And actually he's, he's at a crossroads now. He's at a divided path, divided three ways. And I mean, the idea of a crossroads or a divided path like that's he's got a he's got a decision to make now this is like this is a serious point in the story and well we're gonna have to see what happens right for sure one thing i i just want to touch on because uh what you're saying about iron and his lack of mastery over it because he doesn't know its origin is great and i i didn't think to write this down because i thought i thought it was interesting when i was reading about the symbolism of iron, but I was like, okay, this isn't a, this is kind of a factoid, but I'll keep it in my back pocket. But then as you're talking like, man, this is perfect. So one of the, uh, one of the origins of iron symbolically is the underworld because it comes from the ground. Right. So it's, it's already like in the unconscious and the other much more rare source of iron is meteorites. So outer space, like you you literally could not get a more out there origin to iron so of course he doesn't know the origin of it right like that's it literally comes from the beyond whether it's the under the underworld or outer space so yeah this is he's in trouble he certainly is in trouble and and yeah that's that's a that's a great point like the underworld or outer space yeah they certainly wouldn't have had any real conception of, of outer space either. Like that would have been even beyond our conception of something coming from outer space, which is like, yeah, 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 that's something that exists. They'd be like, oh man, this is like from the gods. Exactly. That, and that's why they love to, like, they would build weapons out of it because, like, it was blessed weapons from the gods themselves. Like, man. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's amazing to see, like, the impact that iron has in, in the, in the cultures. Exactly. Well, shall we see what Vayanamun's decision is? I think so. Okay. This will be the end of this poem. This will be lines 219 to 282. Back to the poem. Vayanamun, old and steadfast, drove along the lowest pathway to the lowest of the homesteads, and he asked, Upon the threshold, is there no one in this household who can cure the wounds of iron, who can soothe the hero's anguish and can heal the wound that pains him? On the floor, a child was playing. By the stove, a boy was sitting, and he answered him in this wise. There is no one in this household who can heal the wounds of iron, who can soothe the hero's anguish to the rock can fix it firmly, and can heal the wound that pains him. Such may dwell in other houses, drive away to other houses. Bainamunin, old and steadfast, o'er the horse his whip then brandished, and the sledge went rattling onward. Thus a little ways he traveled, on the midmost of the pathways, to the midmost of the houses. And he asked upon the threshold, and beseeching at the window, 
Is there no one in this household who can heal the wounds of iron, who can stanch the blood when flowing, and can check the rushing bloodstream? Neath the quilt, a crone was resting. By the stove, there sat a gossip. And she spoke and answered plainly, as her three teeth gnashed together. There is no one in this household who can heal the wounds of iron. None who knows efficient blood spells and can close the wound that pains you. Such may dwell in other houses, drive away to other houses. Vainamainen, old and steadfast, or the horse's whip then brandished, and the sledge went rattling onward. Thus a little way he traveled, on the highest of the pathways to the highest of the houses. And he asked upon the threshold, calling from beside the doorpost, Is there any in this household who can heal the wounds of iron, who can check this rushing bloodstream, and can stay the dark red torrent? By the stove an old man rested, on the stove bed lay a gray beard. From the stove, the old man mumbled, and the gray beard cried in answer. Stemmed before were greater torrents. Greater floods than this were hindered. By three words of the Creator, by the mighty words primeval, brooks and streams were checked from flowing, mighty streams and cataracts falling. Bays were formed in rocky headlands. Tongues of land were linked together. This is a dramatic end to this poem. So he, Vina went looking for help to close the wound, and he's got three choices, and he goes to the easiest one first, which is on the, you know, the lower path. And I'm not sure... I'm not sure that is the right move. Well, usually when you're faced with a problem, you want to go with the easiest solution first. But in a situation like this, where you'd be running out of energy and time is of the essence, you might be able to make an argument to go to the hardest one first because you're only going to get weaker and weaker as as you're you know as you're searching. So it might be worth going because. When he goes there, he finds a child playing on the floor. So, and of course, a child isn't going to be able to stop the bleeding and, and close the wound. Um, it's you know they they don't know anything. The, the little boy is a little boy. They're too immature to to know anything, and, and rightfully so. I mean that children aren't supposed to know these types of things. They're learning. They're trying to get their uh, their way in the world. So. This isn't uh, this isn't like oh the boy should have known. It's like no, he just found a boy, and that's not not useful at all to Vinam Uh And it's it's kind of like uh, you know with this. I, I try to look at this from you know the, the symbolism of the society, and you know he's he's going to the youth to protect him, and but like the very young and immature. And like, what are they going to do? They're not going to change. They're they're not going to be to bring about the the change in society that's needed to to save him. Uh, and they're, and they're very clearly not the the divine child that would that would save him and you know bring in a new age of peace and prosperity. So you know, t- tough luck for Vinam Wynn. And, and then he goes and finds. On the middle path, the crone, which when I was reading this, I was like, oh, maybe we've got some help here because, you know, uh, the image of the crone is often uh, a wise woman who's able to heal and has some has some connection with the, the unknown. It's a, a very common symbol, but she's not able to help either. And, and I, I think there's, I think there's kind of this, uh, feeling or a sense at least to me that she kind of represents like a, a lost opportunity that had he gone there before before she was at this age where like she's lost a lot of her teeth she's uh 
I think in a lot of ways, probably a lot of ways, uh, disabled just from old age, she can't help, even though she has, she at one point certainly had the power to help. I'm sure like she would have, she would have had that undifferentiated chaos at her disposal to, to help, but she's unable to. And then finally he goes to the old man and I, I get the sense that this is like looking, looking back through history to what other civilizations have done and saw, uh, when they were going through similar things. So, you know, the old man, the, the gray beard talking about, you know, there have been greater torrents and uh, greater floods than this were hindered. It's looking, it's looking back at, I think other civilizations being like, you know, this thing is a cycle. Other people have gone through this. Some have been able to solve the problem and some, some haven't, but you know, what you're going through right now is not new. It's been done before. And <laughs> in a way it's like, you're not special, but that's a good thing because it's been done before. So, you know, it, it, it can be handled. And, you know, if, I mean, just read history books, right. And you'll see, it's very easy to see uh, a lot of the things that societies are going through now reflected in what other societies have done before uh, and, and how how they uh, reacted to it and all that kind of stuff. So it's, one, it's really interesting to see, like I, I'm very curious to, as to what uh, the Greybeard will tell him and what he's going to teach him to, to solve this, but it's, uh, he's really going through all the options that like a society has or civilization has to, to fix itself. And he's finding the, hopefully finding the answers in, in the past. Right. I, I think you got it exactly right there. And I do want to confirm it was kind of a cryptic ending to the, to the poem there. The, the gray beard, the old man is in fact confirming that he's got this, he's got this. And the, the progression here is really interesting because it, again, it, it's sort of like that that whole, yeah, the the young don't have the right experience. We've seen this before. Yoka Heinem wasn't wasn't experienced, even though he's he's not really a boy. He well, sort of. He was a young man. He didn't have the right experience, so he didn't have the life experience. And I think it was interesting too that the the woman didn't have the old woman didn't have the right experience either. And the the thing about that is I don't think that's really any sort of a, a fault, first of all, because it's kind of like, of course, not everyone is going to have done the same thing. This actually, it, it brought to mind specialization again, how societies in general have to organize themselves through specialization, like specializing in a certain trade or in a certain branch of knowledge or something like that, and then trading those competencies for one another is how societies work the best. You can't have everyone being a generalist because then they're they're not really going to know anything. And the the thing about that too is that so he he goes to someone who might know this old woman this crone on a symbolic level often she has the answer. She has like the the potion that she makes that could heal him. It's completely plausible that she would have been the one to be able to heal him and it would have worked symbolically as well just for a different reason. It would have been she had the the knowledge that that would have worked for him if she had been the one capable of producing some kind of healing for him. But the old man that seems maybe unintuitive on some level but then when you think about it as it's the the experiences of another civilization where we we see Vainamainen as being the embodiment of one aspect of civilization one particular civilization you could even go as far as to say one particular tribe if he's the embodiment of that and then this old man is the similar embodiment from a different tribe they're exchanging knowledge they're they're benefiting from one another and maybe light spoiler is that Vainamon is going to trade knowledge in order to get properly healed, essentially, which is something that we've we've seen with with Odin in, in Grimness Mall, essentially. He he gives knowledge to the the boy who gives him a, a drink of water when he's having a tough go of it. 
highly it's that's still one of my favorite episodes we've ever done by the way is the two grim to small episodes so highly encourage you to to go check that out if you haven't that's like uh seven and eight i think are those ones anyway yeah at the end of the day though vanamunen has someone who says he's got this and that's awesome right that's so comforting like if you're in a situation where you're just not able to handle it or even it's a life or death situation and someone comes in and is like yep i got this that's like okay you know you're good you know you can trust this person and and you're going to be okay i mean maybe not it, it, it's always possible but that's got to be the most comforting thing and it's a good thing that i mean it made it through all three branches because you're right something like going for the hardest one might have been a good idea but who's to know that the hardest one i'm using air quotes here is is that the hardest one is going to actually be the thing to to have the right result at the end of the road, right? It could have just as easily been the reverse, that the hardest one would have had the most useless person at the end of it sort of thing, right? On a symbolic level, of course, that's all got to, they, they got to say some things there, like Vayner and had to go searching on the highest path in order to get it. Like, of course, you got to go the symbolic route, but still it's, it's kind of like, well, he had to go through all three though. So who's to know he would have made the right decision had he picked otherwise, right? Definitely. And it, I'm just thinking it, it's interesting that like, I'm still trying to uh, sort of mentally chew on the, the crone and the old man, because you, because usually it's the crone that would do the healing um, and, and offer new knowledge. But in some ways I, I can also see how the old man works because he is, he's showing, or he's going to show Vinam Wynn and how to order this chaos again and that he is or that greater chaos has been ordered before and that this is really nothing so i can see how that that works it's just, it's just an interesting uh i guess dynamic between the, the crone and the old man so yeah something I, something that i'm i'm enjoying thinking about for sure yeah the the funny thing with the, the crone that it makes me think of there's uh, the finnish band and Sephirim, they They've got a song, and it's a great song. One of my favorites, one of my wife's favorites, so definitely is "One More Magic Potion." And there, there's like a kind of a whole line and a whole big story that they weave of a of a hero coming to the to a witch's hut, sort of thing. And and it's like, "Bring me a magic potion that will heal my aching wounds," sort of thing. And that's just the the whole. Then they go on like a trip, and they reference the call of Allah a couple of times, and it's it's lots of fun. That's a good song. But it makes me think of this whole, the crone would be the appropriate one. But in this case, it, it isn't actually who fulfills it. So it's, so it's an interesting dynamic. But I, I think you got the, the root of the, the reason why the symbolism is this way in this particular case. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't resist a fun uh, folk metal reference there. If you haven't noticed, I'm into that. Well, it's good stuff. I'll probably check that song out after this. Yeah, it's a fun one. And honestly, I've I think I'm at the end of the road here on this one. We're at another cliffhanger here, Vinamoon, and certainly in a a spot of bother for sure. But he's he's in the hands of someone who knows what to do. So hopefully, that's not going to be so bad at the end. Yeah, it, you're right. It's a it's a cliffhanger, and we've had a. F- We've had a few cliffhangers. It's been it's been good. It, you know, it definitely makes you want to read more. And then, because we're doing it runo by runo, which I think is a good way to do it. I know it, we feel that too, where it's like, okay, what's going to happen next? So, no, it hopefully things start looking up for Vinam Wynn. It gives us some encouragement to keep recording these Kalavala episodes as quickly as possible. But we <laughs> there's still not enough time in the day sometimes to to do as much as we want to. No, that's true. It's true. It's sad, really. <laughs> it is. It is. Maybe maybe one day we'll be able to record an episode a day or something like that. We can only dream, right? Right. Well, this has been a good one. And Vainamurinen, uh, well, that's the story of his wound, I guess, there. And we'll see what happens next time. Absolutely. And I think with that, we'll just finish off with our our usual housekeeping and all that. And again, as I mentioned in the beginning, the best way you can support us now, if you'd like to do so, is on our Patreon page. We launched it just recently, and it's 
definitely the best way you can help support the show. If you do choose to donate through there, we try to provide as much extra value for our supporters there, including for all of our supporters, a little bit of behind the scenes access to what we're doing, what we're up to. A little bit of an insight into our process. We'll probably start because this was actually, we released it quite recently at the time of recording this episode. So we we don't know 100% what everything's going to look like, but I, I think we're both hoping to start to post a little bit more about the the things that we do that we're reading and and how we're how our process really works sort of thing so that's the the first thing that we offer and then the other thing that we we offer if you choose to donate at the five dollar per episode level is early access to episodes essentially as soon as they're as soon as I'm done editing these episodes that I will release them onto the custom RSS feed on the patreon there and Usually it'll be about uh, three days to a week early is when I'm done, depending on how far ahead we've managed to get ourselves prior to our usual release schedule there. And we may do some other things with those early access episodes and at that level and above. It's all up in the air. And if you've got suggestions on how we can offer more for people who are generous enough to donate, We'd love to to hear about it. So we've got some ideas, but at the moment, that's that's where it is. So you can find us at patreon.com slash northern myths. And again, it's just the best way you could possibly support the show. And it means absolutely the world to us that uh, that you listen. And if you want to support, that's that's a, a huge thing for us. So absolutely. And the, and the, the support goes towards things like uh hosting fees, uh, hardware upgrades. And I mean, you know, pie in the sky dreams, like maybe one day taking this show on the road, maybe getting to a point where we actually could release one, like one a day, that'd be awesome. But, uh, but yeah, like, it's just, uh, it's just a way for us to like make this better and better. That's sort of what we're, uh, we're hoping to, to do with all this. So yeah, we definitely appreciate, uh, the support and uh, any, you know, Patreon subscribers that we get. So thank you very much. Exactly. And, and, you know, we'll, we'll start to, when plans materialize, we'll definitely let you know what we're starting to use the funds for. We've, we've got a lot of ideas, especially on improving the, the studio space that we've got and uh, the, the hardware as well, the, the microphones and things like that. So that's, that's all things that we would do to, pretty pretty much right away to start to improve things for sure so that's all in the plan and we'll let you know when we're kind of getting there so yeah that's definitely the best way you can help support the show a couple other ways you can do that as well if you like we've also got a merch store through teespring so we'll we'll have the link below dan is is wearing one of our our shirts if you're watching on youtube and yeah we've got just a few designs from the show a few things with some of our our uh, catchphrases, if you will, find out what myths you're living, things like that. So if you'd like to support the show, you can do so there as well, represent. And the other thing we have is our list of recommended books and music on our website, northernmyths.com. And on those those recommended books and music pages, we've got, especially for the books, a lot of a lot of things that have been really influential for us that helped us start the show and is the basis of a lot of the ideas that we dig into here, as well as the translations of the Kalevala and the Poetic Edda that either we read on the show or that we recommend as alternative translations. And so those are all great books that you can pick up. And the music is all from some of the great guests we've had on our show that we really recommend too. And all of those links are Amazon affiliate links. And if you make a purchase after clicking on one of those links, a little bit goes towards the show. And that's always a big help. But the thing that you get out of it is some great books or whatever else you were planning on shopping for on Amazon. So it's really no risk or extra cost to you or anything like that. And it helps the show out if you choose to, to do it that way. So we appreciate that if it's something you were thinking of buying anyway. So... And beyond that, of course, you can get a hold of us on social media. We're on Twitter and Facebook, Northern Myths there. On Instagram, Northern Myths Podcast. Our YouTube channel is also Northern Myths Podcast. You can get a hold of us on all these channels. We're also personally on Twitter, at North Myth Luke and at North Myth Dan. 
And yeah, we we like to respond to tweets, comments, emails. We do our best to respond as as quickly as we can. Some of the the emails and comments and stuff that we've been getting lately have been like just fantastic, like really really long and detailed, and definitely definitely people have been thinking about what they what we've been saying in these episodes and that's really just honestly honestly humbling and an honor that that uh, we get some of that uh, that feedback and provoking thought and all that and we've appreciated those messages and it, it sometimes it might take a little while for us to get back to such such big messages but we we do our best to to get back to everyone as quickly as possible there so that that stuff is always appreciated definitely i mean when we get those in-depth messages we we want to think about it so that we're, you know, saying something of quality back. You know, we don't want like a big email and just like, oh, thanks for listening. And it's like, no, let's, we like to engage with the ideas. So it might take a little longer for the longer email messages, but yeah, it's not really a problem. It's kind of cool. It's like, oh man, I get to think about these new ideas and yeah. For sure, because usually it's it's stuff that either we we hadn't been thinking about, or maybe we were a little unclear or asking for clarification or something like that. And I mean, we're learning here. I think we're getting better as we go all the time. And so when we get comments about some of our our older episodes, like our really really first few, it's like, yeah, we were we were a little less good back in the day. Uh, please please forgive us. Maybe we'll have to re-record the Voluspa episodes one day, do a special series on that now that we've learned so much more about it. I think we will actually one day. That'd be pretty fun. It's going to be longer than three episodes if we do the Voluspa again. It's going to be like six episodes, ten episodes even, like seriously. Yeah, I I could see it. I was thinking 12, so I'm not... Yeah, it'd be uh, its own little series, really. Definitely, it would. We we've learned so much in the process of doing all this, and and all these conversations, whether it's emails or YouTube comments or whatever, we we appreciate it, and we think about it. We really want to take the time to address them well. So we've definitely appreciated all that coming through here. And yeah, the only other thing that uh, I really have is that we we appreciate reviews. If you want to give us a, a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts or even Facebook, things like that, those are really helpful for us just to have a, a good rating on all those platforms, helps us get in front of more ears and eyes. So that's always something that we appreciate. If you got just a second to, to give us a quick review on your podcast platform, we appreciate that. And if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, we are on YouTube as well. We've got all our episodes on there. And we we have some plans for getting back into making clips out of our episodes. We, we've got other things that we're trying to do to get a handle on all of the the well, the amount of content that we've we've got now. I mean, it's it's crazy. This is this is episode 41, I think, now. And right, like that's if we're averaging like two hours an episode, that's like that's a lot of content. So at the beginning, we thought it would be pretty easy to put these clips together, but it turns out that we've just got so much content and we kind of got behind being organized with that. So we're we're doing some of that first, but our YouTube channel, we, we do have some plans for doing more with it. But if you're just listening on the podcast and uh, you go over to YouTube and give us a, a subscribe, we, we would appreciate that because that definitely helps us to to grow and get recommended to more people and things like that as well. So that's always something you can do to to help us out there if you so choose. So Dan, is there anything I'm forgetting? Well, uh, there is one thing and it's the most important thing. And it's to go out and find the myth you're living. This has been the Northern Myths Podcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs>